National Guard units converging on a hospital trains. in Central Bridges Manhattan. are closed. It's a war zone. This is a very real more danger. More deaths than More than a goal. There's not enough vaccines. No, let me Charlie. stop you there. This is not a panic situation. It's the time prior to the green poison. April lives with her husband, William Kelleher, Bill for short, in an apartment in Brooklyn. For her birthday, he gifted her a copy of the New York Collapse book. In it was a note from Bill. Moving ahead in time, is the 23rd of November, the national holiday of everything America stands for. It's Black Friday, of course. A day of greed, and at the core of it, money. Without knowing it, the people are digging their own grave by spreading the so-called dollar flu that was resting on the surface of the banknotes. From there, it will jump to human skin, to the food they are eating, and like that, spreading on and on. By the time patient zero feels the first symptoms, millions are already infected. From this point, the breakdown will happen fast. Day one, hospitals will reach capacity. Panic will strike. Day two, quarantine zones will be established. Resources will be rationed. Transport will go into lockdown. Zooming in on Manhattan, it's now December 3rd. April couldn't get a hold of Bill and was worried about the outbreak and decided to go to his office in Manhattan. Upon April's arrival, Bill came running out of the front door with two other people, presumably colleagues. Two vehicles screeched up front and men in military fatigues began to open fire on them. April stopped in her tracks. She couldn't move as her husband got shot right in front of her. What had just happened? Did Bill really get murdered? Was he liquidated by armed men? Bill did work as a biochemist at the Sequence Biotech Group a company performing bioinformatic analysis and making them available for institutes working on molecular biology, for example. Bill had to have a connection to the virus. But how? Was he working on something that could have something to do with the virus? Was the government after him? It was all a big blur. April was still in shock. So, as police arrived on the scene, she could only watch as her husband's body was being put in the coroner's van and the police taped off the crime scene. There was another man in the van, a doctor. He seemed familiar, but April couldn't quite put her finger on it. Still, she didn't think too much of it at the time. How could she? Not really knowing what to do, April went on to call the police, asking to talk to a detective. After a while on hold, she managed to get a hold of one, Nina Di Giovanni. She told her what she saw when it arrived at the crime, but to her surprise, no police report had been made on the case. So the detective wasn't of any help, and she hung up. So what to do now? There wasn't much she could do at that moment except going home. But to make matters worse, she couldn't get back to her home in Brooklyn. As the quarantine in Manhattan had reached full effect, the subway had closed. She was trapped on Manhattan, angry, scared and confused. Luckily, she has a friend in the neighborhood, Eva, if she could find her. The next couple of days, April stayed at Eva's place at Grand Plus Wooster at least until the situation blown over. But there was no reason to think it would get better, and it didn't. That's when she started writing in her book, as if it was a diary, hoping it would help her process this whole thing. Day three, international trade will stop. The oil will dry up, the stock market will collapse. It's December 4th, more people are getting sick while the government tries to maintain control over the situation. The quarantine on Manhattan is clamping down tighter and tighter. April managed to find a cop and told him what happened to Bill. But the officer told her that the authorities were too busy guarding hospitals and locking down other areas of Manhattan. So she didn't have to look to the police for help. April didn't have much left. Her keys, $1500 in cash, she managed to withdraw, basic girl things and at the bottom of her purse, the book she got from Bill. Reading it almost seemed ironical now even funny, but of course it wasn't. 
It's December 5th. As the chaos ensues, everything seems to happen quicker and quicker. Day 4. The power will fail. The shells will be empty. The taps will run dry. It's December 6th, and as the power fails across the city, people are panicking more and more. People didn't start to loot yet, but panic buying and riots were starting to occur. The next day, December 7th, Eva starts spiking a fever and coughing until she nearly chokes. After a few coughing attacks she stabilized, but it was unsure for how long. Sarah, or Catastrophic Emergency Response Agency, gave instructions to remain inside and promised vaccine teams were heading their way. But no help came. It is now December 8th and Eva has developed blisters all over her body. Disease Control Department, or DCD, confirmed the virus was a variant of the smallpox. As Eva got worse, it's now December 9th and Eva passed away. Unable to contact her family, April leaves her body wrapped in a sheet on her bed. The day after, despite the death of her friend, April stays at Eva's place. With the help of Eva's neighbors, she carried Eva's body outside and duct taped her driver's license to her body. As it was rumored, Sarah was picking up bodies with refrigerator trucks and storing them at Hudson Yards. On December 11th, April is out in the city as the police and National Guard are setting up barriers. A riot broke out and she had to hide in a nearby restaurant. Please, my baby is stopping. This is your final warning. Vacate the area or be forcefully removed. You are interfering with me. After the riot, she spoke to a Sarah employee who mentioned that the Madison Square Garden provided shelter and served as a distribution point. And while this may have been the case, we know not long after it was taken over by rioters. April 2 was unsure of this advice as the book strongly advised against going to public places with lots of people, and she turned out to be right. As she returned to Eva's place, April was unsure of what to do or where to go. She decided to sleep on it. But the next morning, things would take a turn for the worse. April woke up to a knock on the door. It was Sean, one of the neighbors who helped April carry Eva's body. He was smiling, but there was something off about him. As she looked down, she saw that he was holding a knife. He threatened her to leave the building, and she realized he was serious, so she backed away through the corridor and left the building quickly. Luckily, she managed to grab her backpack before leaving, as the book recommended to keep all valuables in it at all time. Still, she didn't have much. Thousand dollars in cash, extra socks and underwear, a multi-tool, duct tape, the survival guide, a water bottle, tampons, various energy bars and snacks, floss, two little flashlights and four lighters. But worse than that, she didn't have anywhere to go. She was all alone, scared out of her mind and completely lost as she sat in a coffee shop and wrote in her book. She read a passage from the book about the viral pandemic. As she read, April started getting suspicious about merch. He seemed to know a little bit too much. But April had to move. She started moving uptown from Eva's place at Grand and Wooster. She had traveled for a while until she found a shelter all the way in Hell's Kitchen. It wasn't much and it was overcrowded, but at least she had a roof over her head. 
She got through the night okay, though she slept holding her backpack. She didn't have a blanket, but it wasn't cold, as there were at least 100 other people in the room. The morning after, the shelter provided her and the other refugees with some water, bread, peanut butter and vitamins. Not the omelette she dreamed of, but calorie-wise, it did the job. The shelter also had a radio and people clustered around him, waiting for updates from the DCD and Sarah. That morning, the DCD announced that the smallpox strain that was going around was engineered. Even President Waller, who was presumed dead, but probably hidden in a bunker in Washington DC, gave a brief radio address to confirm it. The DCD also confirmed that the virus was spread through the dollar bills, probably done on Black Friday to maximize exposure. In a short message from the Capitol on page 122 of the survival guide, there is a hidden clue. If we take the first letter of every sentence and lay out the letters next to each other, it spells out avoid any cash. And now we find out money carried the dollar flu. Pretty suspicious. Merch knew about the green poison, but how? How could he have known? We don't know. April doesn't know. And that's where it ends for now. It was time for April to get rid of her money. Not much later, April and everyone else was kicked out of the shelter, but this time she had an idea of where she could stay. Bill had a co-worker who lived in Hell's Kitchen, Miko Hirasaki. April met her at an office party about a year ago, and April decided to look her up. Though traveling was dangerous, with a huge explosion even going off along the way, she managed to find the apartment. She didn't expect anything good to happen, but it did. Miko was there and she recognized April and let her in. Miko lived with her boyfriend Drew, a nurse, and Miko herself was a writer for the New York News Media, as we can see here that she wrote an article on Lieutenant Colonel Charles Bliss. After the last couple of days, I didn't expect anything good to happen, but it did. Miko was there. She recognized me and she let me in. They live on the third floor and still have electricity. I'm writing now by the light of an actual electrical bulb. <laughs> Amazing how quickly that starts to seem unusual. Miko's partner Drew is a nurse. He's got some incredible stories about the first days of the bug. Neither of them can believe he's still alive. Every so often, while he's telling his stories, Miko will just reach out and touch him. Like she wanted to make sure he was really there. I wish I could reach out and touch Bill. That night she actually had a warm meal for the first time in a long time. They heard on the radio that the explosion from before was someone trying to tap a gas line in Chinatown. But at least tonight April was safe. The next days, April found herself scavenging the city and found herself at a park in Midtown to find some peace and quiet. But as she sat there on a bench, a lot of noise started building up around her. As she walked down to the southern part of the park, she noticed that crews were blocking off Fifth Avenue with containers and barriers. They were putting up a wall and she was on the wrong side of it, in the middle of the dark zone. As she approached, the crews wouldn't let her pass, leading her to worry about how she was going to escape, how she was going back to her apartment. Freaking out about being stuck in the most dangerous part of the city, she didn't know what to do. Luckily enough, not much later, she found a Red Cross ambulance driver, who she managed to bribe with her last money, effectively getting rid of her last cash. In the back of the truck were three other people. They looked at her as if she was a piece of meat, though this was not the first time she realized that they could do anything they wanted and nobody would stop them. But there was a fourth person in the ambulance. No uniform, but he did have a gun in his hand and he looked so calm as if any trouble that was about to come didn't bother him. It was already the next day and as she got smuggled out of the dark zone she was dropped off at 23rd Avenue. She kept walking south until she reached the lap of Bill. She hadn't been there since Bill's murder two weeks earlier, so this must have been nearby. tough for her. Gathering all of her courage, she entered the office to collect Bill's things and possibly find a clue on who would have wanted him dead. On his desk, there was a comic book card drawing of Bill with writing from her husband mentioning how neither snow nor rain will stop Dr. Liu. Dr. Liu? Was that the doctor that was in the van the day Bill got murdered? Before being able to finish her thought, she heard someone moving around in the building, or it might have been the wreckage. Anyway, she quickly left the building and went to a food truck in front of Flatiron, where she would meet Nico and Drew. What 
We're talking liquid gold here. I could take this across town and get twice what you're offering. Lady, be my guest. Be lucky if someone doesn't shoot you and take it. Come on, man. We're starving. Please. <sighs> Fine. But only because you're pretty and I don't need to see any more pretty dead girls in the street. Pound of chicken and 12 tortillas. Final offer. And hot sauce? Lady. I don't like this. I know, baby. But what choice do we have? We're lucky we even found that gas. A night went by and it's already the 18th of December. April decided to go to the post office on 8th Avenue because of the comic card she found at Bill's lab. Bill knew something and wanted April to know. She was sure of it. As April arrived, she saw a riot happening in front of her. It was rumored that the CDC and Sarah were holding back vaccines and food. The army and National Guard, better known as the JTF at this point, tried to calm down the crowd. It's unclear where it went wrong, but someone got carried away and a mob went crazy as the JTF started throwing out tear gas and the gunfire started. It was pure chaos. April first managed to hide out as she was puking and after some of the gunfire settled she quickly ran as long and fast as she could until she had to puke again. Finally she managed to get back to Miko and Drew's apartment but sleeping that night would be hard as she kept seeing all the dead people though eventually she managed to fall asleep. It's the 19th and April was unsure if she should tell Miko and Drew about her story, about the whole conspiracy including Merch, Bill and the doctor. Merch knowing about the dollar flu and the toxic money couldn't be a coincidence. December 20th, April and Drew started to make plans for the long term. April shared some of Merch's ideas. Drew mentioned that there were two condo towers nearby within a block of their apartment. He hasn't seen anyone in the buildings as they're completely dark at night. However, April was hesitant because the survival guide specifically mentioned that high rises should be avoided as they are death traps if you run into the wrong people. Drew agreed, but said that they wouldn't stay there. Go in late at day, spend the night looking around and leave at first light. He was convinced we would find supplies in there. They couldn't come to an agreement, so they postponed the idea for now. Now. December 21st, April was thinking of the doctor. Whatever the three of them would do about the high-rise plan, she must see the doctor anyway and find out what he knows about Bill. That note on the back of the card meant something. Bill might have been murdered because of the work of the doctor. Still, April was hesitant to go back at the post office, Grand Central or Hudson Yard because of the crowds and escaped convicts. Later, April started thinking. As great as her stay with Miko and Drew was, she wanted to find a place of her own. Merch advised caching supplies at different locations, so if something gets stolen, you always have a place to go to. And April was thinking she should do that herself, perhaps in the near future. It's D-Day, 22nd of December. Drew, Miko and April have scoped out the building, looked for fire exit, and it doesn't look like anyone was in the condos. They had decided to loot the building that evening. Later that day, it was already getting dark. They decided to enter the building through the loading dock door. Drew had a crowbar if they needed to pry it open. After some prying and rumbling, they managed to open the door. It was all dark and spooky. Miko and April had a bad feeling about it and wanted to skip out on the plan. In hindsight, this might have not been a bad idea. It was turning night as the trio entered the condo. It was completely dark and quite spooky. Miko and April wanted to abort the plan and get the hell out, but Drew was persistent. They started looting, finding very useful supplies on the ninth floor, like prescription medicine, antibiotics, batteries, vitamins, boots, dental floss, and a magnifying glass. As Miko, Drew and April were heading up, they decided to take a break in an empty condo. It seemed safe, as it was quiet, so April started writing in her diary and Drew turned on his radio to listen to the party. But that wasn't a smart move. They didn't hear them coming because they had the radio on, but out of nowhere the door got kicked in, several guys started running in and April got hit in the head. Everything went black after that.
She woke up in another room, tied to a chair. April was sure she was about to die and the only thing racing through her mind was that she did everything by the book. They paid attention to foot traffic, watched the building until they were certain it was empty and only used a tiny pen light when searching for supplies. She just hoped she wouldn't get raped as she was surrounded by Rikers. Then, out of the blue, a mysterious man came in. He wasn't wearing a uniform, but he was fighting as if his weapon was a part of him. He shot two Rikers before he even was in the doorway and a third right through the kitchen cabinets. Another three gang members approached in the hall and the hall lit up. The guy went down into cover. April dragged a chair over to him only to see he had been shot. She had never seen this much blood. He had bullet holes in his neck and thigh and there was blood coming out of it in pulses. Tipping herself over she reached for his knife and cut herself loose. Using the knowledge from the book she tried to stop the bleeding but it was too late. Here she was, trying to save a life, but she was powerless. As he was dying, he looked at her. She could only look into his eyes as he passed away. It was Doc Sutton, the last surviving member of Noble Squad, the squad that was now completely wiped out. After things settled, she wrapped his body in a sheet. She had learned a thing or two from the survival guide, so the first thing she did after that was collecting what she could find. She picked up his backpack with the signature orange antenna on it, and though she wasn't a fan, she also reached for his weapons. An assault rifle and a pistol. This got April thinking. Similar to the guy in the back of the ambulance, this guy in civilian clothes had military equipment and that orange antenna. Was there some secret society of vigilante heroes? She couldn't find an answer right then and there. Miko and Drew were dead. The two people who took her in when she was at her worst, gone for making one small mistake. It's the day after, 25th of December, and it's Christmas Day, and April is all alone. After some reminiscing about Bill, she looked through the book and decided what to do next. However, on page 153 there was a puzzle. The page showed different diseases and their virality. Every disease had icons behind them, indicating how lethal that disease is. But something was off. Some diseases that were obviously not as lethal as others had more icons. The amount of icons refers to a letter in the name of each disease. For the first one it's the fifth letter, for the second one it's the third letter, and so on. When completing this puzzle, it spelled out something April was surprised to see. Dr. Liu can help. Dr. Liu was the guy that was on the back of Bill's comic book card and in the back of the van on the day Bill got murdered. So it seems Merch knew Dr. Liu and it all must be connected somehow. April decided to put her plans to find Merch on hold and go see the doctor. Dr. Liu. The next day, April went to the doctor. She asked for him at the post office, known to us at the base of operations. A person in a JTF uniform led her to an infirmary, and there he was, Dr. Liu. When she entered the room, she noticed he recognized her. Taking her into a separate room, a bit panicked, he asked her how she found it, and she showed him Bill's comic card. He was the one that was in the back of the car. He knew Bill, but he didn't know what Bill was working on. There was research towards treatment, building on existing biotech programs, but he wasn't working on that himself. Upon being asked who killed Bill, he said he didn't know, but the shifting of his eyes gave away his lie. April settled for those answers right then and there, and the doctor actually discouraged her from looking into Bill's murder any further. After talking to him, she saw another man with a similar pack. He asked her how the war was going and April tried to play it off cool, but he could tell she wasn't supposed to wear the backpack, but he let her go anyway. She returned to Miko and Drew's place, which was kinda odd to now call her home. She started paging through the book and at page 32 she stumbled on another puzzle. Here's a warning for radiation, where he refers to specific advice on several pages in quite a weird order. Clues in the text reveal that each number refers to a letter from the title. 
so 19 refers to the 19th letter of the title. After she lettered every number, it was only a matter of putting them in the right order. It spelled out the following. Variola virus strain made for use. Merch knew about the virus, this was the proof. She had to find him to ask him what he knew about the virus, what he knew about Bill. But April started feeling like she's sick, as if she's contracted the dollar flu just now. So her search had to wait. The day after, she's feeling worse. She started writing things you only write when you think you're about to die. She was spiking a heavy fever, she's really thirsty and she's burning up. To her surprise, she woke up the next morning. The sun was up, the fever was low again and she was freezing. As she ate some food and drank some water, she started reading and writing in the survival guide. Merch wrote a page about pop-up pirate radio stations, just like the one she's heard on Rue's radio. He seemed to either be crazy or have some inside information, and as we know, she was talking about none other than Rick Falassi. The rest of the day she spent resting. The following day, now the third day of the fever, again to her surprise she woke up, as she thought she was going to die. And she started writing in a book as in a crazy fever dream. But it seemed apparent that someone was looking for her. It's December 30th, the fever passed and she could finally think clearly. She mentioned that one day prior, there were people looking for her. Now she could kind of remember who. At 29, she was listening to the Pirate Radio podcast with Rick Falassi raving on about something. Meanwhile, she was looking at the backpack when all of a sudden a burst of static came over the radio and at the same time, a little gleam came off the antenna on the backpack. She fell out of bed, crawled to the backpack when another burst of static interrupted the transmission only to return to Falassi screaming. In a rush, April cut off the antenna and threw it out of the window. It landed on a roof on the lower building outside, and not even two minutes later these soldiers, looking like division agents, were kicking in the roof and looked around at the windows to see who threw the antenna. Luckily she managed to shut the window in time so they didn't know it was her. But who could these guys have been? Were they division agents? But she thought the division agents were the good guys. Maybe there were some subdivision in the division? She didn't know. April felt less and less secure in Miko and Drew's apartment. New York was being carved into territories by the JTF, Rikers and now also Cleaners. It's a war and she was stuck in the middle of it. She needed to get out of there, out of the apartment, to look for merch. But where could he be? Would he be in Harlem? No. Maybe he was in the dark side. It's T plus 31, or December 31st, the last day of the year. April's red pen ran out of ink, but after some scrounging she found a pencil, which is where our story starts. It's almost the new year, which we'll call year one. The book calls for a new calendar. There was actually a party that night in a building April was staying in, where 19 other people were living. Celebrate that they made the new year, that they actually reached that far. Maybe things were actually picking up. It's New Year's Day. All is quiet. Rikers lit a huge bonfire in Herald Square, while other people shot maybe a thousand balloons in Times Square to celebrate the new year. It's 6 a.m. and still dark and quiet outside. April used this to her advantage and went to Chelsea Pierce to do some trading since there was a market now. There's lots of people trading over there, even people trying to smuggle you out of Manhattan, which is still very impossible since the Coast Guard controls the waters and helicopters spot anything from above. Every tunnel access is either locked down or guarded, so getting out isn't what you would call easy, if that's even what she wanted. But she had unfinished business still in Manhattan. After she did her shopping at the market, she returned home. The next day she was scavenging in the city. There was a running battle up and down 8th Avenue. The JTF had armored vehicles and were holding their own, but Rikers were shooting RPGs from the upper floor of the building above. A JTF fire team went in, but before it continued, April got out of there and took the long way home. She went over to Tribeca. This new neighborhood gave her goosebumps, as she knew there was a lot of trafficking. She needed to scout the area before continuing to merge last known location at Warren Street. 
After dark, she went out to the piers and she made the mistake of getting too close to one of the piers. She saw people getting in a boat, with sentries looking out over the pier in the direction of the closest JTF checkpoint. The woman put on a boat had her hands tied. April went to the JTF checkpoint to tell them about the situation, but they said they would look into it once they had the resources. It's January 3rd. It's been a month since Bill was murdered. April was thinking about moving out. Every night she heard gunfire. The JTF is getting pushed back to Chelsea and she's at the edge of Riker's territory and a new group calling themselves the Last Man Battalion. Their leader, Charles Bliss, the one Mika wrote about, wants a new nation with him in charge of course. So she's living in the middle of a war zone. She didn't want to get hit by an RPG or get raped to death by Rikers. She liked it here but it was not worth staying. Today she would get out, look for a place below Houston Street. The first objective was now finding out who Merch was and where he is staying. Towards the back of the book she found a picture of some World War I soldiers with musical instruments, possibly Dutch. She remembered she stumbled across a page where it said Merch had Dutch ancestors. Could that be a coincidence? Is there any relation? We don't know yet. New Year's resolution for April is to go to every library to find pictures of those World War I soldiers. But where to do that? The main public library was close to the dark zone, so that would be too risky. Perhaps the New York University then, NYU. It's time to start scouting that place out. The next day, April walked down Broadway, all the way to Houston and cut over into their lower east side. She scouted a few places she could use as a new place to stay. April got close to the NYU library, which appeared quiet, but Washington Square Park right next to it was full of people. She decided to do surveillance for the next 24 hours and to enter the library afterwards. First she went to swing by one of the caches at the playground, wherever it might have been, to pick up some supplies. Later the day she decided to see Dr. Liu again. She wanted to help them, be an eye on the street and let them run tests on her as she survived the dollar flu. In exchange she would want a channel open inside the post office. Dr. Liu had information on Bill's murder and she wasn't giving up on that yet. When at the post office, the doctor did some blood tests and took some other samples. She didn't get much out of him, but now at least she was inside. Next day, she was to meet Vasquez, a JTF officer that coordinated human intelligence. But for now, this was all she had to do. 24 hours passed and it's now the 5th of January. April had settled on a place, on the 4th floor above a restaurant. The family down there sometimes even made it work every now and again, and April had made a deal with them. April would go out for supplies and the family offered her a room. With a place to stay, she could now look for the picture. Walking towards the NYU, she entered the library. It was quiet, with a spooky vibe. As she took a few steps, she saw bodies hanging from the railings of the upper floor balconies. It had been rumored there was a cult of librarians who went after people that defaced books. But the place looked empty. Carefully, she started searching through the books for the photo of the World War I soldiers. And after a while of searching, she finally got the book and found the same photo. It looks like they were French soldiers, not Dutch. She tore the page out and as she was doing it, she realized that she made too much noise. She heard sounds deep in the stacks right away and without even an attempt at stealth, she bolted straight at the door. She burst out of the door and she looked behind her as she saw librarians chasing her. But they wouldn't cross the street. April quickly walked down into the crowded park and after calming down, catching her breath, she traded some 9mm bullets with some locals for a meal to eat on the walk home. The day after, April wrote in her book, one page at the end of the book, the conclusion, had a hidden message. Every first letter of a paragraph combined spelled out, find me. April later found something which meant she couldn't stay. That something was the address that was clued in Merch's name all this time, Warren Merchant. She was going to move over to Tribeca, to Warren Street, even though it has been the most dangerous part of Manhattan, on her way to find Merch. Using a Dutch-English dictionary, she translated the name of Mr. Merchant, or should we say, Mr. Koopman. We arrive at the last day, April recorded in her diary, January 7th, with the writings in brown pen. It was hard to reach Warren Street, street gangs were in constant battle with the JTF and it wasn't the place to go if you didn't want bullets flying around you. But as she arrived on the address on Warren Street, no one was there. Except there was a missing person poster on the door. As she looked at it, her heart started pounding. It was her face on that poster. She knew people were watching her, but 
didn't know who Merch was. How did he get the photo? Was he watching her the whole time? Still, April was determined to make it to Merch and she was thinking of what she was going to say. On the poster it said, please contact me using and then a phone number. A puzzle once again. Every letter and its position referred to a word in a sentence. For example, the first number is 2, so as it's the first number, we'll look at the first line and the second word. Spell it out and you get the following message. April, I've gone dark. Come to 117 West 58, basement level, Copeman. This address was in the dark zone, just under Central Park. This blew April's mind. He had been watching her. He must have been. Merch contacted her and she was about to see him. So, April took off to the dark zone. As she was on her way, she approached the dark zone. Nearly there, she was walking on East 47th Street when suddenly a strange man approached. He looked like a division agent, but there was something off about him. Nice backpack. Where'd you get it? A friend. It looks familiar. Where are you going with it? Over the walls. Really? Be careful what you find in there. And more careful what you bring out. April was scared shitless, but she managed to stay calm. After exchanging a few words with Aaron Keener, she continued to the walls. But before she could climb over them, she was stopped by a JT officer with an all too familiar name. Headquarters, I have a single civilian Caucasian female attempting to enter the dark zone. Look, you can't stop me. I can't let you. Hang on, HQ. What are you saying, lady? My name is April Kelleher, and I've got to get in there. The proof I need, it's behind those walls, and I'm not going to stop until I get it. All right. Convince me that letting you go in there is an assisted suicide. I've been in there before. I can handle myself. Tell you what. I'll let you go, but if you get killed in there, you don't come crying to me, okay? Guys, I promise you. Now, if you'll excuse me... HQ, never mind. After this, April went dark. Until the expansion of Dark Zone with DC 07, 8 and 9, we couldn't go to the previously mentioned address. But now we can. Upon reaching 117 West 58th Street, we see an entrance that leads down into a basement, just like Merge mentioned. It led to a room which was definitely a hideout as it was stocked with supplies and sleeping bags. There's also a whiteboard on which names are written with coordinates behind them. April and Bill's names are on there, including coordinates behind their names. When entering April's coordinates in Google Maps, we travel to a building on Union Avenue in Queens. Bill's coordinates don't lead anywhere. What this means, we wouldn't know. Did she find merch? Do the coordinates refer to their whereabouts? Is Bill alive? The story of April brings up more questions than answers. And as the division stories at an end, perhaps we're never getting the answers. Or are we?